what's distinctive about Derek's work is his objective view of reasons, that we can have reasons uh, to work out what's right and wrong and what's good and bad. Many people believe that ethics is just about uh, our desires or what our group thinks is right and wrong. And what is overall very distinctive about Derek's work, which is very Kantian in one way, is that he believes there are reasons uh, to, for example, settle on one size of population or another, or settle on whether it's good for a person to continue to live or not. Uh, that, I think, is the most distinctive characteristic of Derek's work at a high level. But then there were specific areas where Derek made huge contributions in reproduction, population policy, and death and well-being. In fact, I think the, the best thing I've ever read on what constitutes a good life or well-being is actually just an appendix in Derek's book, Reasons and Persons, where he articulates three major approaches to well-being, hedonistic or happiness, desire fulfilment, which is similar to economics, and an objective approach. But in, in the area of reproduction and, and end of life, uh, those are the areas that have most heavily influenced my own work. Uh, Derek made groundbreaking contributions in understanding what's particularly special about reproductive decisions that even today many regulatory bodies and many professionals have failed to appreciate the significance. So Derek um, described what has been called the non-identity problem that when you're dealing with reproductive decisions, the choice that you make will determine the identity or who comes into existence. And this affects whether that individual can be harmed or benefited by the act of being brought into existence. So just to give you a snapshot, the standard approach in reproduction and genetics is one of freedom uh, and non-directiveness. We believe that people should have uh, whatever child they want, whether they want to have children or not, uh, and the timing of, of reproduction. And, and Derek persuaded me that, uh, in fact, it's not merely a matter of what we want. Uh, and one common uh, instantiation of this, this argument is actually the advice that Public Health England gives. It tells people when returning from Brazil who may have been exposed to the Zika virus that they should wait six months uh, before they try to have a child. Now the child that they will have in six months time, and this is exactly an example from Derek's book in 1984, and it dates back to the 70s when he first introduced this idea, the child that they will have in six months will be created by a different sperm and a different egg than they would have today. So when Public Health England says you should wait six months, they're saying you should, of the possible children you could have, select the child who will be healthier. You should. It's not a matter of just, you know, what do you want to do? Here are the facts. It's that actually there are reasons for you to wait six months. So actually, commonsensically, we believe in reasons. But Derek very clearly articulated the nature of these reasons and this approach to reproduction really inspired my own theory, which I'm famous or infamous for, called procreative beneficence, the moral obligation to select the best child. And I extended this argument around disease to an argument around well-being in general, that we ought to select the child who's got the best prospects of the best life, based on our understanding of the genetics and its relationship to this concept of well-being. So this is a very radical, even today, approach. Most people think that well, we can't accept something like procreative beneficence. We can't say there are reasons to select better children. But really, this flows straight out of Derek's very sophisticated analysis of the nature of reproduction and his philosophical ideas about well-being.